it's going to be around. And generally, when people have been successful against terrorism, it uh, it really means that the terrorists and, and the people who are, are driving it figure out it is no longer worthwhile for them. So they quit for a while, and then a couple of decades later, it starts again, and so on and so forth. But it's, uh, it's a tactic, and of course, uh, as everybody knows, uh, in this case, uh, it, it, ideology and all that, the religion plays a part, all of those kind of things. So it's a very complicated issue, and, uh, and uh, it's uh, very important, I think, for, for all of us to continue to uh, think about it, to continue to learn about it, and continue to take the kind of steps we have to take, uh, not just mm -hmm. as a nation, but really as a, as a community of, of free world people who believe in uh, in each other to try to reduce uh, uh, the situation down to where you can live with it. So with that, Yona, why don't I turn it over to you and you can uh, Thank you very much, take it uh, from there and introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, uh, General, for your uh, kind uh, introduction. I, I just, uh, before we introduce our uh, distinguished uh, speaker, I would like to call your attention uh, to the new volume of uh, John Gray. I know you wouldn't like what I'm saying, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, an honor to mention this is the second volume of the early years from uh, 60, 68 to 75. The um, first volume was from 1950 to 67. This, uh, this book was uh, just published, and uh, we provided you with the uh, information um, on, <coughs> on the, the volume. Um, so uh, again, the uh, general, I, I think, <coughs> uh, background is uh, well known, um, and um, is uh, leadership. Uh, is um, indeed unique, but the lessons are the important, uh, I think, um, uh, issues here, and um, we would uh, recommend this highly. By the way, uh, whatever royalties uh, are generated, they are uh, actually provided uh, for uh, the servicemen and their families. So, uh, with that, we're grateful to the general for taking time for his busy schedule to join us and to participate in our discussion. We also distributed um, information about <coughs> our, um, our distinguished uh, ambassador um, who um, contributed a great deal to uh, the uh, security concerns of Spain, the international community. Um, I uh, actually uh, asked him perhaps to uh, provide some background uh, information um, about um, his um, family simply because it comes from a of generation, of four generations actually of diplomats, and uh, his role as a, um, a diplomat um, is less, I think, appointment was the ambassador of Spain in India, and in that region, uh, Nepal and Sri Lanka and so forth. <coughs> and he served also in, uh, in parliament um, and in the academic community and um, professionally as a lawyer, the media, etc. cetera. So um, I, I asked him to perhaps um, go through some of uh, this uh, experiences. As many of you know, uh, we uh, do have ambassadors uh, forum. Uh, we uh, had the uh, honor also to invite the um, Spanish ambassador, Pedro Moranes, um, a few months ago, uh, who spoke at our event. <coughs> now, before um, 
three years, so the slower to speak, I uh, have a <coughs> obligation to mention that one of the distinguished, I think, colleagues from Spain, uh, General Velarde, um, he came um, with a delegation um, from his um, center, nuclear fusion center at the Technical University in Madrid uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, unfortunately, I just got the word that he died and um, we are going to have an obituary um, in um, honor of his many contributions, um, not only to the Spanish atomic energy um, concerns, but internationally, the IAEA, and um, academically. So um, uh, again, I uh, distributed um, some information on his uh, many contributions, but uh, we will have also an obituary in our next uh, publication. Um, now, uh, finally, I would like to um, mention that um, in Geneva, we like to remind ourselves uh, every month about uh, some of the anniversary uh, dates um, in order to learn some of the lessons. And uh, just looking at the month um, of February, I just want to mention that uh, this is the 20th anniversary of the Ben Laden Fatwa, urging attacks against uh, Americans wherever they are found. And um, actually earlier, um, back in 1993, the fatwa was in 1998, but in 93, as uh, many would remember, um, and this is the 25th anniversary, the attack on the World Trade um, Center, the bombing, uh, killing six and wounding uh, some 1,000. And uh, you, you know, of course, uh, what happened uh, afterwards with 9-11. Finally, uh, since uh, we're dealing with uh, the role also of uh, diplomacy, and we have a distinguished uh, diplomat, i like to, to mention that back in uh, 1918, February, it's already the 38th, I think, anniversary, the M19 terrorists, they seized uh, the Dominican Re Republic Embassy in Colombia, and they held some uh, 20 ambassadors and dozens of others at the time. So the diplomats are also um, obviously selected targets and victims. So uh, with that, um, <coughs> Sir Ambassador, it's Thank all you. yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Jon Alexander, and good and old friend, General Gray. Thank you very much. Professor Don Wallace, thank you for being here. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be at the Institute yet once again. Um, Professor John Alexander has asked me to make a, a short introduction of what my background is. Um, it is true that I am a weird kind of diplomat. I am a hybrid in many ways. I am a career diplomat that uh, probably was carried away by uh, the call of duty in a, a strange way and accepted to, uh, to play politics. So first I was the chief of staff of the Ministry of, of Homeland Security of Spain for four years. And then I ran for office uh, in the Spanish Parliament for for uh, three successive elections. Then finally, um, uh, politics got tired of me, I think, because I c can't say the same of, of me getting tired of politics, although I think I was. And I went back to the Foreign Service. In Spain, you can do that, as is the case, for example, in Germany, not so in, in the United Kingdom. Other countries allow that to happen. In our case, we are still a young democracy. Our first democratic election act after dictatorship was 1977. In, and the Spanish Constitution of 78 allowed civil servants 
uh, to uh, be able to hold elected office and go back to their to their uh, profession because they thought that it was the only way to have a political class of a certain quality. Uh, that was very, very much the case in the early years of Spanish transition. Unfortunately, I can't say the same of, of what is going on in many countries of Europe today, especially Spain. Uh, after after um, three terms in Parliament, 12 years, and having been those 12 years the spokesperson of my party, of the party that I used to belong to, uh, for foreign affairs, four years in the majority and eight years in, in opposition. I went back to, f to the Foreign Service and was appointed ambassador to India, and current to Nepal, Bhutan, eh, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives. That is a very complicated part of the world, as all of you know, and uh, in many ways it did complete my uh, world vision. I really think that one does not understand the complexities of world geopolitics if one does not have full understanding of what is going on in the subcontinent or in what uh, many call Central Asia. But uh, if one uh, thinks that uh, the borders of India stretch from Pakistan and Kashmir touches uh, Afghanistan all the way to, to Burma, and uh, it also has land borders with Nepal, Bhutan, uh, and sea borders with Sri Lanka, and with the Maldives, then you can see that it is a country mm, that is very heavily and growingly involved in the stability of the world, and that many of the problems that are very demanding to all world leaders in, in this 21st century are happening in that region or in the vicinity of that region. Um, I just wanted to make a very frivolous but necessary comment at the beginning of my talk. Too many shows on TV are trying to picture terrorism and the fight against terrorism in a romantic way. There is a lot of honor in the fight against terrorism, but it's much uglier and it is much more complex than it is shown on shows like uh, Homeland uh, in, in, in the United States. There's, in my opinion, only one show that it is remotely uh, accurate on the cruelty and the, uh, the monstrosities that are committed by Daesh, and that is a show by uh, British TV called The State that I strongly recommend. It really is about how people are recruited today. And I am going to be speaking today at, uh, at length about the new tactics of recruitment of terrorism that have been practiced in the last 10 to 15 years and perfected in the last, let's say, th five. I will pick up on the comment of General Gray that I think was absolutely brilliant, and not just because I had a similar comment at the beginning of my talk and I showed it to him, that strategy and tactics are different and that a lot of people confuse them in the fight against terrorism, and in fact, that's exactly true. The war against something can only be the war against the real strategy behind terrorism that is nothing else than uh, domination, world domination, power, raw, crude, brutal power, and the ideology that backs it. As um, all systems that crave for absolute power, they are fueled by an ideology. And this is an ideology, not a religion. And the twisting and the transformation of that of parts of that religion into an ideology is exactly what is behind jihadism. Call it radical Islamism. But there is something that we need to bear in mind, and it is that ultra-radical, ultra-orthodox, ultra-conservative Islam always has created channels that lead very easily into radical Islamism, and radical Islamism is the ideology that fuels jihadism. Let's put it in the theory of, of, of concentric circles. All Muslims are not Islamists. All Islamists are not jihadists. And all jihadists are Islamists. And that is extremely important to understand. So what we have to, to, to fight against is not Islam, because Islam is the main victim of, of jihadism. It is Islamism and its product, tactical product, that is 
jihadist terrorism. The evolution of terrorism is something that needs to be taken into account. I hate it when people speak about new terrorism. There's no such thing. Terrorism is old, but it evolves. It's a, sh it's a changing beast because it is a surviving beast. It tries to survive. If you would take the speech of President Roosevelt of 1901 in the funeral of President McKinley, and I strongly recommend you to do that, and you take away all the temporary uh, references of the beginning of the 20th century, and you see what he says about anarchist terrorists that killed President McKinley, that speech could have been written today, but probably not in such a good English. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we have to bear in <coughs> mind that terrorism is not new, that mankind has practiced terrorism. Some states have done it. Terror has been a tactic employed by people that had a clear strategy throughout history. And that, again, is something that we have to bear in mind. So let's make it very clear. If we are to wage war, it is not against terrorism. It is against the ideology that feeds terrorism. And that we are losing. We are winning the tactical battle. Daesh is defeated in Syria. It's, in, it's retrieving in Iraq. But the ideology is still very strong, very much there. And I'll come to what is happening in Europe that unfortunately is becoming the epicenter of this new, let's call it evolving or changing terrorism. What happened in 1989 when the Soviets were kicked out of Af Afghanistan by, uh, let's call it that local jihad? All those that went from different parts of the Ummah, of the community of believers of the Islamic world to combat, to expel Soviets, went back home. And we know what that happened, what that, what that provoked. Let's see what happened in the Balkans. Let's see what happened in Algeria. Let's see what happened in Egypt. In so many countries, when those terrorists and those so-called fighters, those how do they call them in, on TV? Insurgents. An interesting way to call a terrorist. Uh, went back to their countries of origin. Those countries of origin imploded. I'm not saying that the regimes that they were fighting against were perfect democracies. I'm not saying that. I'm being extremely analytical. They provoked chaos, havoc, violence, terrorism, death, and economic uh, chaos. Gustavo, uh, which countries do you have in mind they went home to? For example, Algeria. Yeah. The, the, there was, there was uh, thousands of Algerians that participated in, uh, in Afghanistan. And in those countries <coughs> that were better, better controlled and were able to flush out the terrorists or not allow them back in were the ones that were able to, 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 uh, to withstand that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, wave of, of attacks. So now we have in Europe a new kind of homegrown terrorism. Dis uh, disgruntled local recruits, frustrated Daesh recruits, those that were recru recruited by somebody in their countries and tried to go to Syria through Turkey or Iraq and couldn't make it and stayed back home. And they're trying to do something to compensate because there is uh, generic instruction by uh, Daesh saying, if you can come, do something back home, and that's what they're trying to do. The return terrorists of Daesh, those that have completed a mission or are tired of fighting or ha have been given the instruction by their leaders to stop fighting in, uh, in Syria and go back to Belgium, to Spain, or to France, because that's where they're returning to now. And right now, what we need to understand is that Europe is not importing terrorists we're exporting them. There are more terrorists leaving Europe and going to other parts of the world than actually radicals coming into Europe and becoming a menace to Europe. Because all of the attacks that we have suffered in the last years are people that were living in Europe for years. Some of them were nationals of the countries that they attacked. 
and were, because we have the Schengen system, moving freely without any hindrance. So let's just briefly uh, analyze the, uh, the recruitment methods that we have been able to confirm through the, the Barcelona attacks of August of last year. In the attacks of Madrid of March of 2004, a lot of so-called experts did not think that that attack was a jihadist attack because a very large part of the terrorists that were involved in those attacks had not been properly radicalized, were only in the process of being indoctrinated, and they were not even halfway through there. And what we saw is that there was a ringleader, a cell leader, a charismatic figure that recruited them, gave them purpose. He used their anger, their hatred. And we just thought, I mean, this is impossible. This is not, re these are not real jihadists. Because these guys, two weeks ago, a month ago, were drinking and partying and, and, and consuming drugs and getting high and what, whatever else. But the inspiration of the attack was very clearly a jihadist attack. It wasn't an Al-Qaeda attack, per se, but there is a missing, a missing figure that would explain many things that we still don't know 14 years later. We don't know who that leader of the cell, who recruited them and only partially indoctrinated those that attacked uh, the trains and killing 193 people the beginning, as you know, the, it was said it was 202, and then later it was, it was uh, corrected. Uh, many years later, actually, it was corrected, and it's 193 victims. So right now, the Barcelona attacks give us uh, the uh, perfect example of what started in those days, and today is very much the trend. The new kinds of cells that terrorists are, 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 are organizing in, in, in Europe um, tend to act in the same way. They can be two, four, ten, it doesn't matter. What really is important is that there is always a key figure, uh, uh, a, 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 a radical preacher, imam, I don't want to call them imams because they're not, uh, somebody that has been properly indoctrinated by Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, Daesh, whomever. And that doesn't happen, and I do want to uh, stress this, that does not happen in the Internet. This kind of indoctrination is personal. And it is possible to prevent it. We're not doing a proper job in it. Some intelligence services that are helping Western countries flagged some of these people to Western services, as did Spain with one of the terrorists that planted the bombs in the international uh, airport of Brussels, Zaventem. We told the Belgian authorities, in fact, everybody in the Schengen system, that our security cameras at Barajas had found somebody moving but of course, that kind of footage is only uh, analyzed ex post. And we only knew that he had gone through the controls once he had taken the plane. We need to pay better attention at these things. And it has happened also, by the way, in the United Kingdom. So coming back to Barcelona, it was an attack that happened in four phases. And in the first two, nobody got the message. The first was a terrible explosion on August 16th that was caused, according to the police, or the, uh, the autonomous police of, of Catalonia, because of an accident. Well, I don't know many houses in the world that have dozens and dozens and dozens of gas cylinders and that, and that those go off, not leaving a single brick over a brick of that house. Well, the leader of this cell died in that explosion, and they only found his remains days after when they realized that something very, very dangerous and wrong had happened in that house. And there was a second explosion the following day. And the investigation judge told the police, this is very strange. There is something here. This can only be a terrorist attack or somebody 
planning a terrorist attack. Police said, oh, Your Honor, you're exaggerating. Let it go. And she was shut down. Hours later, 13 people were assassinated and dozens were injured. Again, it happened under our nose. So what happened? How did this fellow act? This character, Abdel, uh, Abdel Baki Esati, was a common criminal. He was a, dr a drug trafficker, born in Morocco, established in Ceuta, and was then served time for trafficking with 12 kilograms of cocaine, not a minor thing. Not chocolate, not blankets, not TVs, not money, 12 kilograms of cocaine, 30 pounds, give or take. This chap was recruited in jail by one of the terrorists of March 20, 2004 of Spain. He started being radicalized. When he came out, and this is the proof of what I'm saying about this evolved method of, 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 uh, of recruitment, he started moving around Europe. He was a Spanish national. He went to Belgium. He went to France. He returned to Morocco. He went to different parts of Spain, met with people. And there he was indoctrinated hard way. And he was recruited by Daesh. He was a Daesh member. Everybody else that was a member of his cell wasn't. And most of them, I would say the majority of them, had not really properly been radicalized yet. Then we know what, what else happened. There was a shootout where one of them died, and then finally they were uh, arrested or they were uh, killed by the police. This is showing a lot of flaws in our system. And all of this in this moment is actually being catalyzed, is being boosted by geopolitical challenges that are not only not getting better, they're getting worse. And th it's, it, it's like Tom Friedman uh, uh, used to say to students of, 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 of the master degree in, in, uh, in journalism in, in Colombia, when somebody asked him, a Spanish journalist, by the way, what she should do if he had any advice for her. And she says, why don't you specialize in the Middle East? It's, it's, uh, it's kept me going for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And probably keep us, ev everybody going for another 30 or, or another 30. So yes, we've got Afghanistan, we've got Syria, we've got Iraq, we've got the new Quartet versus Qatar crisis, we've got uh, uh, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, the Kurdish issue, and this black hole called the Sahel. And I know of very few think tanks in North America and even in Europe that actually are focusing on the Sahel. And that is one of the most dangerous spots in the world. And it is the most dangerous for a certain part of Europe, definitely the South. And only because some countries in, in the Maghreb are being extremely effective and serious in controlling terrorism and they're almost impossible to control borders, thousands and thousands of miles of deserts. They are keeping us safe at a great price and sacrifice. And sometimes we are not sufficiently grateful because we don't even pay attention to what they say and to the, and to the warnings that they make. So now let's just, just see how they, they are recruited. And it's everything. Everything is used for the recruitment. It's not just one. It's all of them at the same time. Internet, family and friends, travel back home, going to other countries that have a bigger influence of jihadism, the local mosques. Sometimes those mosques are not controlled by radical imams. The imam is a moderate imam. But the, those that go to pray there are radical. And they just go there. And they have patterns. They know what to look for. They know how a, a disenchanted hater looks, what his reactions are, and they tailor make the recruitment to that person. If he has uh, issues with drugs, with alcohol, with, with money, with crime, they tailor make the recruitment to that person. There are mosques that are radical points of recruitment. Quranic schools 
jail. The returnees of Daesh that do their own recruitment also. All of these are extremely important uh, means that they are using. We are, in my opinion, in one of the most dangerous moments that we have seen in terrorism since 9-11. Something's boiling up. Daesh did not replace Al-Qaeda. It came to act on top of Al-Qaeda. Al-Nusra is not Al-Qaeda in Syria. It's something else on top of Al-Qaeda and Daesh. We have the lone wolves, that thing that was so much in fashion in the so-called, uh, among the so-called experts in Europe and other places in the world. That's not just the thing. They are beginning, those lone wolves are beginning to be coordinated. We don't know how or by whom, but it's happening. And all of this needs to be pro properly addressed. None of what is happening and the lack of strategic vision, and I'm coming back to uh, General Gray's comment, is going to help us at all. And either we really beef up our, 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 our game or we're going to have very serious trouble in the next, in the next years. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Thank you. Well, it's an uh, excellent, uh, I think, introduction to the challenge, and uh, you really put your finger on uh, one of the most uh, complicated, I think, um, issue, because um, in the past uh, decades, the focus was more territorial, meaning to go to a training camp and you served in uh, also Libya, but uh, even before your time, uh, they we identified dozens of um, training camps in Libya, and people came from uh, all over to be trained there. Uh, also, of course, in the Middle East and uh, Lebanon, as we know very well, and Yemen and uh, elsewhere. Uh, today. I think uh, the, as you mentioned, that the magnet is um, a, uh, a a person um, who can mobilize uh, these uh, people, uh, provide uh, some inspiration, guidance, and all that. But um, I think one of the uh, challenges for us is um, not only to um, identify uh, the, uh, the cells um, around um, a particular individual, but uh, we have to look at the virtual, I think, environment, meaning the social media mm. and the internet and the role of technology um, and so forth. So the question arises, how do you deal with that? Uh, particularly in an environment where there are business um, interests and concerns, and uh, how do you provide some sort of um, mechanism that can regulate um, what is, uh, let's say, fake news, or uh, what is uh, legitimate uh, information? Mm. Well, that's a very, very important question, Professor. The balance between civil liberties and, and the legitimate um, uh, interference, I was going to say, of states trying to keep everybody else safe. Where, w how to strike that balance? Now, we, I think that mo most of us in this room have one or several messaging systems that are supposed to be safe. Uh, either WhatsApp that is now encrypted, or Signal, or Telegram, or so many others. The bad guys use them too. So, uh, do we know if we want to be safe from hackers or people that are looking into our private lives, uh, do we know for a fact that governments aren't able to interfere or to go into, into that? Is government allowed to look at everybody's uh, privacy and to invade everybody's privacy just to keep everybody safe? Then what is the difference between a, 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 a horrible dictatorship that said exactly that. That was the excuse of all of them in the 20th century. 
we are invading people's privacies and we are limiting your rights because we need to keep safe. The moment that you break that balance is the moment that you cease to be a real democracy. Where is the sacrifice? It's very complicated. It's an extremely complex question. Uh, and, and then, you know, we know that the recruitment in the Internet uh, happens not through the, these social media. The social media is, is, a, is a channel of communication. But recruitment happens or indoctrination happens in password-protected, encrypted websites that appear and disappear. So f in, in order for the, 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 the aspiring terrorist to have access to these things, he needs to meet somebody f physically who will give them the, 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 the passwords. And as he evolves in his level of radicalization and indoctrination, he will sort of like be given a diploma and he will be able to go to the next stage in a different in a different uh, uh, web, uh, website. And many a time when those websites are compromised, they just make them disappear. The servers are in God knows which country. They could be anywhere. And there's so many uh, detours and deviations that uh, IT technicians are better and better. And we're always, we're always one step behind. And, 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 and uh, uh, sometimes governments are one step ahead on conventional tactical reactive measures but in this new battleground that is the electronic world i don't know i think that we are pretty much one or two steps behind and this is really one of the main questions uh do you want to ask a question or is it open you don't know okay uh we'll open up um the uh, the discussion, but before before that, I, I want to, to ask you, um, in addition, obviously, to the uh, individual and the non-state groups, my question is, we focus a great deal of attention on the role of states, state-sponsored terrorism. And in fact, uh, just looking, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, at uh, some of the notable um, events or incidents in the, the month of uh, February, I recalled that the former Prime Minister of Lebanon, Hariri, was killed by a car bomb in Beirut that um, was uh, actually um, operated uh, through the Syrian government. And um, we find today, obviously, that uh, uh, Syria is still uh, one of the most prominent uh, state sponsors of terrorism, even resorting to some uh, chemical uh, means or bounds of uh, recent uh, weeks and, and months. And of course, uh, the role of uh, Iran. Can you make any comments in terms of the role of states, if we can somehow reduce uh, the impact of states sponsored in this mm. field, um, can we reduce the threat of terrorism? Thank you, Professor. Again, this is a question of great complexity, and one has to really make a difference between uh, states that tolerate terrorism, states that are, um, let's say, uh, intimidated by terrorism and therefore are, are, are not acting or reacting against terrorism and those that are actively engaged in promoting, not only promoting, that's one, one phase, but even one step more, they are the actual terrorists. And, 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 and uh, uh, explaining what you just said about the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Hariri's uh, assassination, Prime Minister Hariri's assassination was ordered by the president of Syria directly to his viceroy in, 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 uh, in uh, Lebanon, Rustom Ghazali. I had the privilege of meeting Hariri a couple of weeks before his assassination. It was at the Ritz Hotel in Madrid, and uh, Mariano Rajoy and I were with him in that room. He was extremely worried. 
And he told us that he had been summoned by Rustum Ghazali to uh, his office in Stura, the first city in, of Lebanon on the side, on the Lebanese side of the border. And that he went into the office of Rustum Ghazali, who was the head of the Muhabarat and therefore the viceroy of, of, of Syria in, in Lebanon, and he sat across the table, something that you normally don't do with even with somebody that was no longer a prime minister but had been the prime minister of the country that you were sitting in. And he said in, in Arabic, who gave you permission to sit dog, kalb? <coughs> he was shocked. And he said, you will vote for General Lahoud's uh, re-election. Yes or yes. He said, you don't understand. We will not vote for General Lahoud's election. And he says, you will vote for General Lahoud's election or else. And one week later, he was dead. So, I mean, if anybody has any doubt about who did what and why, then there you go. And uh, he said this, we saw him days before he was assassinated, and he told us exactly that. So, uh, if, if, if you put into the equation what Iran has been doing for, for, for decades in, in Lebanon, then, you know, you have to put things in perspective. Because uh, when uh, Amal did not become the terrorist organization that they were wanting it to become, they created something else, which was Amal Islamiyah. Since Amal Islamiyah wasn't violent enough, they created Hezbollah, which was, in fact, another arm of the Revolutionary Guard. And who bombed the American embassy in, in, uh, uh, in <coughs> West Beirut? Who bombed the barracks of the Marine Corps? Who bombed the barracks of the French Legion? Who? Hezbollah. Of course. Nobody else had the means. And Hezbollah alone didn't. Even if Hezbollah actually did not exist as an organization. That, that. So it was a very clear hand that was behind that. And since I'm not an acting diplomat anymore, I can say these very stunning things in a public, or in a public audience. But it's true. I mean, and, and then uh, is the whole country responsible for the monstrosities of, the, of its regime? No. Is each and every Iranian a terrorist? No. Is Iran a, a, an individual dictatorship? No, it is an oligarchy. It is 30% <coughs> of the people that oppress 70% of the people. But there are 30% of the people in the country that agree with what their leadership is doing. And it's not just one person. It is all of them. And that is something that has to be taken into account. You cannot get rid of one dictatorship and everybody is going to fall in line. Who, uh, who do, in your opinion, rules Iran? Who calls the shots? I think it's... The it, quid and the terrorist groups. I, I think that it is, it is the radicals that yeah. are, are represented and, by Ali Khamenei. And the leading, the leading uh, terrorist people in Iran today were the instigators of the Beirut bombing of our headquarters. Absolutely. And so that's the connection right there. And the money that came into Lebanon to make that happen, both at the embassy and, uh, and at the Marine headquarters, and the French headquarters was also blown up. Yeah. We lost 90, 96 French military people yeah. within two minutes of the other explosion. And I've been to the cemetery too. But the money came from Iran and to the Damascus and then to the Beirut front. And the explosives that blew up the Marine headquarters were not just TNT or not just a truck bomb. They were the latest Soviet fuel-enhanced explosives, which were purchased from the former Soviet Union and brought into Lebanon. So this was a a major kind of an operation, and 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 that really is not clearly understood by anybody yet. So, uh, uh, what you say about these things, and and you know this whole terrorist idea, as as we've said, has been around for a long time, and uh, uh, in the case of the Chinese, for example, it was uh, phase one of Mao Zedong's four phases of how to fight yeah. was terrorism. Uh, those of you that uh, have read about the, uh, heard about the Vietnam War from people like this lion crowd, Burns and the rest of them, 
They said nothing about the terrorism that the Viet Cong used in South Vietnam. In 1965 alone, terrorists, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese terrorists, assassinated 1,000 village chiefs who were supporting the South Vietnamese government. If you were with me in October of 1965, south of Da Nang, when I went down to see what was going on, you'd have seen a small 10-year-old Vietnamese girl run up crying. Her father was a village chief. She had been he had been assassinated the night before. And this girl's arms were cut off at her elbows by terrorists. Not a nice story, but so this is the kind of thing that, that you know, goes on and on and on. And, and I say one of the biggest challenges we have is educating the people of the free world on what this is really all about. It's like anything else. You, we got to educate the good people and tell them what this is really all about and how hard it is and how they must learn to play the what if game and how they have to learn to be careful and how they have to learn to look at things and see what's going on, all of that. They're all, they should be, and as far as the surveillance state and all that Mickey Mouse, I spent 25 years after I retired on the National Security Agency Board of Advisors. I, I, I know many of those wonderful young men and women who work there. I have never, ever, ever heard anything about doing something that wasn't legal. As a matter of fact, the only reason that, that there are very few, uh, historically, very few in national security agency cases go as high as the, as the government to, uh, to look at, at the judiciary process, is because the people at NSA police themselves and they prevent themselves, they keep themselves from, from doing something wrong. Do they make some mistakes? Sure. Who in the hell does it? Anybody that's, uh, you know, it's a lousy carpenter, doesn't drive his hand, you know, hit his hand with a hammer once in a while, he's not driving any nails. But, but that's the kind of, you know, people we have. And, and, and to, to criticize this agency, to criticize intelligence, to, you know, that, and all this liberally Mickey Mouse, that's all, that's all a bunch of hogwash. And, and we need to attack this through the educational system so that our young men and women uh, really get both sides of the story and let them make up their own mind. The young people will make up their, they'll make up their minds the right way if they're given the facts. American people have always been good about that and so has the free world been good about that. If you give them the facts, they come up with the right answers. Yeah, I, I wish, I, I wish uh, that were true uh, in Europe, General, because unfortunately I think that there is more and more a part of society that doesn't want to listen to the hard truth. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, 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 the risks and realities that we're facing are ugly and scary. And people in prosperous countries pr uh, prefer to look the other way and hope for the best. Yeah. And that, you know, the guys that are in, the men and women that are in charge of, of security uh, uh, will take care of, of, of everything. That, the fight is a social fight. That's the Everybody's easy, that's that's the easy <laughs> way out. So no, that's the that's no way out. Yeah. That, yeah. Is, that is the recipe for disaster. Yeah. Everybody has to be involved in the fight against terrorism. It is, it is, it is everybody's obligation to point out uh, there's, there, there are, there are a, a, a zillion ways. You don't need to be an expert on, on Islam to speak to somebody and notice that there's something weird about him. I... If I speak to, to, to somebody and I start speak, speaking about, about uh, religion and Islamic schools of thought of Sunni Islam, and uh, I see how his nail, nails or uh, fingernails are cut, <laughs> how his distash or his uh, abaya or his uh, jilaba uh, are, are short or long, uh, how his beard is fixed, and his mustache is short or is, there's no mustache at all. There are signs that are very clear that somebody is very, very, very ultra conservative. And that that is the stage just before something or even he has already uh, gone into the world, the dark world of jihadism. There are many ways. And I'm not saying that we have to become uh, a, a police state. I'm not saying that. As the general very well said, it doesn't happen at least in decent states it doesn't happen. The guys that are controlling all of their citizens, and you can be sure that they do, are countries like Iran or Syria, where, for example, the sons and daughters would denounce their parents if they had criticized the leaders of their countries. Okay, There's uh, another aspect, too. Uh, sometimes, sometimes these uh, uh, charismatic uh, 
leaders are not necessarily bad people. Sometimes they're, they have good records. Uh, we found this out, for example, in the, in the uh, 60s and 70s in the military, uh, a different challenge. But remember then, we had enormous uh, racial problems in those days, and, uh, and uh, we had a lot of, of uh, controversy over that. We had uh, money uh, pouring in near the bases by these radical groups to stir up trouble and all that. But many times we would find that the, uh, the person who was uh, the leader was uh, not necessarily a high-ranking person at all, maybe a sergeant or something like that, but he had a beautiful record. He was never in trouble or anything like that, and he was actually the, the leader and instigator of, of a lot of the racial challenges. Uh, this was true whether we were talking about rednecks or Samoans or Puerto Ricans or anybody else like that. So uh, it, uh, it, it takes a... Uh, it takes a careful thought process, uh, what you're outlining there, and it takes, uh, uh, it takes a, a lot of study to, to be halfway as smart as the ambassador and others about the things to look for. It's, it's, a, it's not an easy issue. No. Excuse oh. me for talking so much. Professor Don yeah. Wallace? <coughs> I'd like to put some questions to Gustavo, if I may, but <coughs> excuse me. Um, I think General Gray has put his finger on many things. Um, I think we sh I think we made a distinction, but we should. Uh, Yona mentioned state-sponsored terrorism. I really would put that to one side. Iran, Syria, uh, over the years, many other countries, Vietnam, China, many countries it, it sponsored terrorism, which the general quite rightly says is to some extent a tactic or a technique. Um, I'd also put to one side this issue which the ambassador touched on, which I think is really of profound importance, which is how does a society balance off safety and security on the one hand versus liberty on the other. Different people have different preferences. I have a very conservative wife who puts safety, I think, above the First Amendment. I'm not one of those. I'm a lawyer. But I think that, I think I agree with General Gray. I think America copes with that damn well. That's why I think it's a little bit mischievous of the President to blast the FBI and the intelligence agencies who are awfully crucial to our safety. But I think, the, so I put those to one side. And, and lean in on what uh, the ambassador first began with. He used the word ideology to, s to describe sort of radical Islam and, and, and the jihadists among them. And I think we're all kind of worried. It is sort of like taking arms against a sea of troubles because they show up in different places, as you point out. Some of the recruit, many of the recruits apparently are sort of on the way to being unhappy and being mobilized. Some of the leaders are what you've described, just petty crooks. Others may be more inspirational figures, the way the general has suggested in other settings. And the question is, I mean, what do we do? I mean, how do we think about this systematically, it seems to me, is the issue. I mean, because before we can organize ourselves, we have to think. Um, sometimes we act before we think. And I think this is tough as hell. Um, I've lived in the Middle East. I lived in Turkey, not in an Arab country, but my work took me throughout the Arab world. Um, by the way, I pray to God this will not hit India in a big way, which might have the fertile ground for this eventually, too. But how do we, th specifically, how do we think about Islamic terrorism, largely centered in the Middle East? How do we grapple with it in such a way that I will feel comfortable, uh, you know, that the society will be comfortable? And you've said we can do a better job. And you pointed out that you think the Europeans may be a little bit beside themselves. I mean, they have the Tsengen system, and they, they've worried, you know, when, as the, uh, as the refugees came in from Syria, through Turkey, Greece, etc., up through the Balkans, of course, they began worrying about this sort of, what is the outside border, you know, can we allow free travel? And, and certainly, but let's call that a European problem, but I think we have a sort of a more global problem, as you suggest, which is how do we systematically think about this so that we can cope with it? Uh, and you, you called it an ideology. I mean, the Soviets, in some ways, are a bad example because they both had a powerful not as powerful as they thought, state and an ideology. Now the ideology seems to be gone. We still have an ambitious state. Some people have tried to compare radical Islam to Soviet communism. I think that's a very bad analogy. It is. And everything you said suggests that. But, how, but really, in terms of educating ourselves, how do I educate myself? Because we all should be educated. How do we educate even Yona, who's a total expert in this matter? How do we really think through to the bottom how we cope? I, I really think, Professor, that uh, radical Islamism is an ideology that operates like a, a cult in, in every way. And all cults tend to 
control its its adherence. Uh, its members have to uh, uh, follow a code of conduct and rules that are extremely strict. If you do not venerate your superiors and the leaders of your movement uh, and the twisted ways that they interpret uh, uh, their holy scriptures, you are not considered a member. Uh, you see, every Islamist, no matter of which organization, throughout the decades that this ideology has existed, have always said that their interpretation of the Quran and of Islam was pure Islam real Islam. They called it in many different ways. Now, the, the, the most commonly used in the last 20, 30 years is pure Islam. So everybody that is not like them, everybody, anybody that doesn't abide by their rules, their structures, their, their, their submission, their absolute submission to the twisted rules and laws that are imposed to them by their bosses is an apostate. And this is a very important concept. Those that are not Muslims are non-believers. And those that are Muslims that are not good Muslims or left Islam are apostates. And in a very extreme interpretation, anybody that comes across an apostate has to destroy him. Because if he doesn't, he becomes himself or herself an apostate. The, 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 the way to justify or to legitimize, better said, an attack against uh, states and leaders is by calling the state or the leaders an apostate. Because again, this is a, a, a twisted version of, the, of, of real Islam. The Islamists and the jihadists have made it possible for a concept that is essentially personal, because only a person can be an apostate, they have made it possible, they have created the concept of states becoming apostates, regimes becoming apostates, governments becoming apostates. And therefore, the whole collective reality of a given country can be declared an apostate, and therefore, war can be waged against them. And this takes me to something that is a bit technical, but it's absolutely necessary to understand where so many analysts, especially law enforcement analysts, that are, again, more operational and tactical and strategic, and we the people that are in the academic world, we have to be in the strategy, right? So we have to understand what is jihad. And there's a very important American professor that has probably the best book ever written about the subject, that is Professor Cook of Rice University. Uh, and based on his findings, I added uh, a 60-page chapter on jihad in one of my books. So. Jihad, according to the Prophet Muhammad, is twofold. Greater jihad and lesser jihad. And the greater jihad is the real important jihad. It's what really was meant to be jihad, and it's the personal improvement. Everybody has to thrive to become better. A better believer, a better Muslim, a better husband, a better wife, a better professional, a better professor, a better person, anything the personal effort that everybody, it's like a daily goal. That is my greater jihad. And the lesser jihad is holy war, because it's a polysemic meeting, meaning. The lesser jihad is very clear, and you can only wage holy war, lesser jihad, if certain requirements are met. And anybody that declares a lesser jihad a holy war without meeting this criteria, is committing the gravest of sins. And again, the birth of, of modern-day uh, Islamism that was born with Sayyid Qutb, in my opinion, the, the great ideologue that actually feeds all of these monsters of different groups, it was him who, with his books, fed or created the ideology as we know it today. He created the concept of individual jihad. Every Muslim can declare somebody an apostate, which is impossible because only a religious authority has the capacity and the authority to do that. So a given Muslim, A, let's call him Ali Hassan, comes across somebody, let's say uh, Salman Rushdie, if, 
if, if a fatwa hadn't been issued against him. And he read the uh, satanic verses. And he decides that, uh, that, uh, that Salman Rushdie is an apostate. He kills him, and it's okay, because the new ideology, the new uh, uh, structure of Islamism has been created in such a twisted, effective way by Sayyid Qutb, one of the most brilliant minds. And because it's one of the most brilliant minds, he is so dangerous. He lived in the United States. Unhappily. Unhappily. And that was one of the bases of his, of his hatred towards the West and centered especially in the United States. He lived in Texas, by the way. Yeah. Hmm. OK, um, we, we have a few people who would like to ask uh, uh, questions. Uh, ob obviously, just as a footnote, a very important uh, question that you asked there were some uh, more questions about the education and how can we educate ourselves. The good news is that uh, there is a awakening um, in the Muslim communities uh, in the West, but also in the East. Um, Muslim countries uh, like uh, Morocco, where the, the king is organizing, um, I think, some sessions with the clergy, with imams from other countries from Africa, in order to deal with uh, tolerance uh, uh, Islam. The same um, trend you find in Egypt, in Indonesia, and many other countries. But at any rate, uh, this is um, an issue, first and foremost, for the Muslim community uh, to begin and to get whatever support from those who are not Muslims. Let me move on. Please identify yourself, and please a short answer. We don't have much time. Dr. I'm president of AAA, uh, International Security Consultants. I must compliment the ambassador on, on really presenting like a scholar practitioner. And you've excelled in both spheres of uh, being a scholar and a practitioner. So thank you so much for a very lucid presentation. Uh, the first question is personal. You've been a diplomat and a politician both, and you've worn both hats. Uh, which do you think is a better strategy against uh, terrorism, the political, the diplomatic, or some combination of the two? That's one question. Second question is bearing on your stint in India uh, and South Asia. Uh, given uh, you very rightly described, I'm a little biased, I'm from India originally, so you, I would say that it is a, a crucible to learn more about security in, in its manifold dimensions. Uh, which Indian st uh, strategies or which South Asian strategies against South Asian terrorist groups like Lashkar-e Taiba, Taliban, Jaish e Mohammed, etc., do you think uh, could be imported or are applicable to the West? And conversely, which Western strategies could be implemented across South Asia against South Asian terrorist groups? Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, um, I, I, I actually forgot to, to, to mention India, uh, and, and Professor Wallace mentioned it, so that gives me the opportunity to, to say both things. Um, the, 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 the fight against terrorism has to be necessarily multidimensional. It cannot be monodimensional. It cannot be only diplomatic. It cannot only be political. It cannot only be operational. It cannot only be, the, let's call it, let's, let's, let's go again to the original comment. Let's start, divide the fight against terrorism in the strategy and the tactics. The, one is planning ahead and trying to dry all the wells and the sources of the ideology because if you defeat the ideology, if you counter the ideology, if you manage to, to, to prevent people from joining and to bring those that, are, that joined out and pull them out when you can and if you can, and actually there are some countries that are, that are applying um, uh, methods that were uh, used to r recover victims of cults, to deprogram them. And it has been to an extent effective, but there are there is a point of no return. And we must not think like some Nordic countries think, and I don't want to point my finger at anybody, but we know that we have seen in CNN or in Euronews these very um, uh, uh, rosy, uh, uh, you know, presentations on TV of 
uh, a, a given program in some small village of guys that returned from Daesh and that were being reintegrated in, into, into society. I mean, excuse me. A guy that maybe killed 100 or 200 people, planted bombs, and that, that, that killed women, children, and, and uh, elderly, how can you reintegrate that person? Because nobody knows what he did. Nobody knows what kind of monster that person is. How can you, there, are, there is a point of no return. People that are impossible to recover for society, as is the case of some uh, psychopaths that are in jail. How do you reintegrate somebody that has killed 30 people? You can't, it's impossible. And, 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 uh, and about your, your, uh, your question about India. India is the second largest Muslim nation in the world today. And India uh, has proven that, as is the case of Indonesia, that uh, um, Islam and democracy are compatible. Because India could not be a democracy when it has 16.5 or 17% of its population uh, uh, of Islamic descent. This said, there's another thing that India has excelled at, and it is that the proportion of radicals among the 220 million Indian Muslims is the lowest in the Islamic world that we know of. It's very difficult, it's very complicated, probably impossible to know the proportion of radicals in any given society, but it ranges from 3 to 4 percent that could be in South Asia to 20, 30, 30 something in some countries more uh, closer to the Middle East, and I won't point my finger, I want to be as discreet as possible, don't want to get myself into trouble. But there are some countries that at a given moment of their history, not too long ago, not the case uh, anymore, in secret surveys, the, the level of support for the Islamist ideology reached uh, uh, almost 50 percent, right? And that has gone down, that has gone down recently. So India has been also effective on the operational tactical front. India has, in my opinion, excellent foreign intelligence. The research and analysis wing is, a, is an exemplary uh, service, in my opinion. I think that India, India's intelligence bureau is fantastic. And India's military intelligence, that has a very clear objective that I am not going to state here, has also done a phenomenal job. India has not been preserved by terrorism. In fact, India has suffered brutal attacks of terrorism, and probably one of the leap, quantum leaps in the terrorist tactics was the Mumbai attacks of November of 2008. Never before had you seen that the dozens, several dozen uh, terrorists held at bay some of the best trained military and security forces because, not because they were better than the security forces that they were opposing, because they knew those hotels by heart, because they could mix with the population, the local population, perfectly, because when they, when they were surrounded and defeated, they dropped their bombs and their guns, and they just put on some, 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 uh, uh, somebody's uniform and used uh, the, the badge of the Oberoi or the Taj Hotel and left with, uh, among the victims as, as, a, as one more victim, and then just simply disappeared in a 29 million inhabitant city. Well, India has not pres been preserved from terrorism. I went to see the, 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 the border between Pakistan and India. Pakistan is a victim of jihadist terrorism. Three, four days before I went to the, to the, to the, to the border of, of Pakistan in Punjab and saw the, the celebrated ceremony between the border, uh, the BFS and the, and the Rangers, they had suffered an attack that killed 100 people on the Pakistani side. And it was empty, of course. It was full on the Indian side, it was empty on the Pakistani side. So actually, uh, you have incidents in, ca in Indian uh, uh, Kashmir all the time. And some you can call uh, insurgents, but some are pure and simple terrorists. And, you know, semantics in the fight against terrorism is a very important part of tactics and strategy. Okay, uh, please. Mr. Schweitzer. 
Uh, my name is Glenn Schweitzer. I, I conduct research in this general area. Uh, I really appreciate your on-the-ground observations, and I have uh, two questions relating to them. Uh, you, you talked about uh, rec uh, recruitment, one-by-one -one recruitment, but there are increasing reports of recruitment of gangs, not one-by-one, -one, and I wonder if you'd comment on that. Uh, secondly, there are increasing reports of disenchanted members of some of these groups who are trying to get out, uh, and particularly foreign fighters. And I wondered if you had any uh, numbers or percentages on uh, uh, the number of disenchanted uh, ter uh, terrorists, uh, who, people who thought they'd be terrorists, and the number who are escaping and the others who are killed en route. Actually, gang recruitment is, is something that, uh, that uh, is, not, is, is not contradictory with what I said, because the gangs are people that share uh, uh, points of view that uh, may be a group of five or six or 15 or, or 30, I don't know, guys that are in the, in the French banlieue that fight their rivals that could be of a different religion or the same religion, but uh, to control territory or distribution of drugs or what have you. and. Uh, mm, they, if you if if you've ever been to 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 the to the banlieue of of big cities in France, there are some places where the police does not go in. And we thought that that only happened in other places in the world, and now it's happening in some parts of Europe. And the authorities actually have to negotiate with the with with the thugs that control certain parts of the cities, and make concessions. And it is. It's a very ugly part of those cities. It's gray and sad and poor and lonely and desperate and desolate. And those guys are looking for glory. Everybody is. And somebody comes along and tells them, you know, you're not just a thug that is dealing with drugs and that is, that, that is raping women and, and, and beating up people that you don't like. You are soldiers of God, and everything that you do, you're going to do somewhere else, and you're going to have a, a purpose in life, because you're going to still do exactly what you're doing, but you're going to do it as a soldier of God. It's very easy to recruit. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, uh, uh, you, you just clean your slate, and you, it, you, you, you stop being the dirty little petty criminal that you were five minutes ago, and then you become an, a, a glorious soldier. It's very, very attractive, as, as, you, can, as you can see. And then... Um, the disenchanted people that want to get out. There are people that were fooled into this, or people that maybe even were criminals like the ones that we just described, and, and in fact want to get out of it. Those are recoverable. Those are not like the ones that, the hardcore guys that are beyond recovery. But those are many a time discovered on site, and they are decapitated, shot, killed, tortured, anything. A lot of them never make it back because they're simply killed. And then they tell the families that they were killed in action. And there's no way that nobody can know the difference. Because they will never allow the world to know the number of people that are, in fact, deserters of the, of the organization. But they do let everybody in the organization know that the fate of those that betray them does not only affect them that are tortured and killed, but it will affect anybody that they can get their hands on. And the places where their families live, normally they don't live in, in the Avenue Foch, the places where they live in France or in Belgium or in Spain or in Germany or in or Norway for that much, because there are some guys in Norway, those guys are at the mercy of the delegates and the thugs of Daesh that are there. So you know that when they are making a threat that if you dare uh, uh, desert and abandon the organization, your sister, brother, mother, father are going to pay the consequences, even if it's in Bergen, Norway. Hmm. Okay, any other questions? Yes, uh, Mr. Ambassador, right, right here. One second, wait for the mic. Wait for the mic? Okay. Do you want me to shout? Got my hearing way, in, if so I, I can by the shout. Way, the show state. It, it, it depicts exactly what you just said. It's the, the, those that want to get out. <clears throat> Mr. Ambassador, you, did a, you started your talk with a very interesting and I think useful analysis of the two categories of Islamic terrorists, because we're talking about Islamic terrorists, not some of the other groups in the world. 
between, I guess you'd call them the indoctrinated operator leader and the others who are not fully indoctrinated kind of followers at this point because they haven't yet been indoctrinated. And you made the point that the, the leaders, the, the ideologues, the, the, the operators, have been largely indoctrinated not through social media, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's an interesting and analytical point. But given that, the followers are, may, are not fully indoctrinated, as you said, but they're sufficiently motivated to, to, op, to participate. And they seem to be largely reach that level of motivation through the, through the public, through, I guess we call them, what do they call them? I'm not up on this new social media. social media. So if that's the case, we have a double, two level of reaching out and indoctrinating <coughs> the leaders directly. Put soldiers, for want of a better term, at least in the first stage through public media. How would you like to that question of cutting the appeal, the motivating appeal to the foot soldiers? Social media is very important for, for indoctrination, and in the internet is very important for indoctrination. As you probably remember, I described how uh, uh, jihadists are uh, guided through different websites that are, that are password protected as they evolved in their level of radicalization. But the thing is that uh, um, at, at a certain level of operational, let's call it relevance, you unless you're a lone wolf, that doesn't happen only in the internet. Because, because Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and especially Daesh will never trust somebody that they uh, will recruit exclusively through the internet because it could be an intelligence service. It could be anybody, it could be a trap, it could be uh, 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 some, some, some kind of, of, of attempt to, to penetrate them. They need to know the person personally. They need to meet him, they need to test him, they need to to, to uh, it, they go through endless uh, traps and questions and this and that. But that is only for the, 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 the non-commissioned officers, let's, let's put it that way, the sergeants and, 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 the, and the staff sergeants. And then even stronger tests and, and uh, uh, inquiries and, and tricks and traps, the higher you go in the echelon. You see, before, in the, in the early years of, of this century, you would distinguish between uh, high value and highly indoctrinated operatives and low value but highly indoctrinated uh, uh, operatives. The, the, the common point being that both were highly indoctrinated. For example, 9-11, there were 19 terrorists. All of them were highly indoctrinated and highly valuable operational guys. Green Forum were nothing but fairly recently recruited muscle. Yeah, but muscle. highly indoctrinated. Highly it, motivated. And, and indoctrinated. In motivation well, and indoctrination. It's, it's, it's a point of discussion. You can, it, 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 I, in my opinion, and I have proof of that, t the time of, of, of indoctrination is not necessarily directly proportional to the intensity of the indoctrination. You can, it, it, if you have somebody that is extremely charismatic, and all of these guys were, were recruited by the top people in the recruitment of, of Al-Qaeda, the best of the best of their, of their guys, they were, they were the, the, the elite forces of Al-Qaeda, so to say. But that, it, it doesn't really affect our discussion, you see. What, what I'm trying to say is that this evolved in a way that to be able to be more agile faster in the reaction, in the attacks. They didn't have time to check that all of the cell was properly indoctrinated. They just needed some of them, one, two, three, tops, so that they, they would know all of, the, all of the aspects of the operation and the other guys would just follow. For example, in 311 in Spain, there, the, the guys that were left, maybe there were two that were actually really, really indoctrinated besides the, the emir of the cell that was out that we never caught. And when, when, when the police surrounded the, the apartment in Leganes where they were, and they knew that they were, they, they were, they were, they were uh, doomed, the guy that was going to uh, 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 detonate the bomb was one of these highly indoctrinated guys, but the other guys weren't. So they went into their rooms and hid under mattresses and went into the bath, bathtubs trying to survive the blast. 
a guy that is highly motivated and highly indoctrinated doesn't do that. And this is proof of what I'm saying. And that is exactly the kind of guys that did the Barcelona attack. No, we, this, the, the lesson that we have to draw of this is not, is, is not a Byzantine discussion if, if this is like this or, uh, or like that, if the apple is green or yellow. This is not what we need to discuss. What we need to know is that these guys can make attacks easier and faster than they did 20 years ago. And this is what counts, and this is what we have to focus on. Gustavo. Okay, one more. I have an operational question. Yeah. You know, the, the top people who do this, the top people in Al Qaeda in the past, Al Nusra, now with the uh, Daesh somewhat scattered, who, are, I mean, is there still an, a top center within the Daesh? There's no such thing as a center in either a, 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 um, a, a terrorist organization. Uh, the, 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 the center are just symbols. So it can be uh, al-Baghdadi, or it can be uh, the deceased bin Laden, the monster. It doesn't need to be some, something. It just needs to be an idea. But who the does idea the checking out? Who checks out these recruits? The guys, the local guys. The guy that is actually, the guy that came back, or the guy that was indoctrinated by somebody that was important, that guy has all the, the elements to know if he can use uh, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Hassan or Ali or, or Mahmoud. He needs to know who is who in his cell. And, and, and if any of those don't pass a, a simple test, they won't use him because they cannot take the risk. Many of the, of the uh, cells have fallen because there were loose ends. The guys of Saventum, for example, those that were not totally radicalized, they're more vulnerable because they're not willing to go to the end. They're not willing to sacrifice their lives totally. They're going to run away. You see less and less suicide attackers. The guys from Bataclan were, were you had, uh, again, the, uh, uh, people of the two kinds, those that were absolutely motivated and those that were less motivated. And, and, uh, and we are going to see more of that all the time. Okay. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I'm watching uh, the clock and it's ticking and General Gray will have the last word, but before no, no. it speaks, uh, he has the last word. It says closing comments, the lawyer. <laughs> no, no, not on Don, the program. Don has the closing comments. Yona will have the last no, word. No, no, I'm not going to have the, um, but uh, seriously, um, you, you really describe the very comprehensive battle that uh, different segments of society can and should play a role in uh, combating terrorism including the education, the media, and also the role of diplomacy um, in, in dealing with this issue, not only on the strict diplomatic uh, level, but um, number one, um, sadly, uh, victims of terrorism and also diplomats and embassies who risk their lives in order to save um, colleagues and comrades, like the takeover of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran mm. and uh, the American hostages um, were held at the embassy, and then the diplomats from uh, Canada were able to rescue some of the people. In this spirit, I would like to present to you one of our reports Thank you so much. on the role of diplomacy, American perspectives, but uh, we are going to have another publication on international perspective, and uh, hopefully we can also incorporate some of you. It will be my pleasure and my honor, Professor. Thank you so much. General. As usual, I'm, I'm, I get to speak when time's up. <laughs> so, well, I want to thank everybody for being with us, and I would just say that uh, uh, sometimes when we talk about these kinds of challenges, it almost seems uh, overwhelming and, and too big, and that we can never have any kind of success. Uh, I'm reminded of a different kind of idea. It has nothing to do with terrorism, but in the 1970s and 80s, uh, one of the biggest threats that we uh, faced in America was the former Soviet Union submarine threat. And uh, anti-submarine warfare was very complicated, 
and the United States couldn't solve everything at once. But what the Navy and others did, they bit off a little bit of the apple at a time, and they made a little bit of progress uh, each year. And by the end of 1970 and the early 1980s, we had a pretty good system to defend against that kind of capability. So maybe the answer is, you know, do what you can, uh, keep the, trying new ideas, uh, keep uh, uh, reinforcing the successes you've had and the like. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, we have to have a master, uh, you know, a master education program to go on to tell everybody what this is really all about and, 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 and what, uh, what people are trying to do and, and that kind of thing. Uh, the issue that you bring up about, you know, a pure Islamic thought process and you're either an Islamic or you're nothing. Uh, apostate. That's Even a chat, well, apostate or whatever, but, or nothing, uh, and should be done away with. That, of course, has been a, uh, a global issue for many, many years, certainly since uh, since the year 1200 when uh, <laughs> when uh, when Genghis uh, walloped the uh, Islamic people pretty bad up there in the northern part of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Central Asia. So, uh, and then, of course, a lot of it's been uh, moderated by the Sunni uh, Shia controversy. Yes. And that uh, took up a lot of their problems, and that's why, in some ways, the other religions and all uh, were able to get along. So that's the answer. Uh, they've got to get along, and uh, and somehow uh, more moderate Islamic thought process has to take over if uh, there's ever going to be the kind of world we want. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. you know, we have to finish some time. Oh yeah, you did. So yeah. you're, very you're good, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you so much, General. You are superb as always. Okay, yes, great. My, my honor to. No, no, no. Share this time with Gustavo. Professor, you didn't have.